Right, so um, I'm delighted to be able to show you this paper. This is, as you can see, called Toggling Bistable Atoms via Mechanical Switching of Bond Angle. And it's the result really of 18 months worth, maybe even more than that, of experiments. And Brady filmed some of those experiments um, maybe six or seven months ago. We had to keep the results of those experiments, we had to keep that video really secret until now. And um, now that I've got the page proofs in my hand, we can go ahead and show you that, that work. So what we see are each individual blob here is a single silicon atom. These atoms form little pairs called dimers, which are, are, are little two atom units. We're going to bring a tip in and we're going to move one of those atoms, change the bond angle and flip it. So what we basically have is the smallest possible toggle switch you can have. So Adam is going to, to move the tip to a particular position now. He's going to point the mouse, he's actually going to use the mouse pointer to put a cursor at the position on the scan where we actually want to bring the tip in. And then what will happen is that the computer will register that position and move the tip to that position and then it will move it in and move it back out. And all the time while it's doing that, it will make a measurement that will allow us to work out what the force on the tip is. Where is this actually happening? Oh, yeah. This is, this is all happening in here in an ultra high vacuum system. The pressure in there is 3 by 10 to the minus 11 millibar, 14 orders of magnitude below atmospheric pressure, and uh, roughly, and at a temperature of 4.7 K. So it's, it's happening actually in, in, in here. Everything's embedded in here, everything's in vacuum. Everything, that, in fact, even if it was working out, you wouldn't hear anything. It's some um, very, very small movements. When we did that particular measure, yes, sorry. So what's happened here is that the atom that was um, once here, the atom that was down, what we've done is we've brought the tip and we've pulled that up. So it's, ju it's jumped up underneath the tip and suddenly appears at this, this, this new position. Um, How can you tell from that picture? Yeah, just from, from well, from experience <laughs> largely and from spending many, many hours in here, day and night. But this, this line here, this, what we would call a discontinuity, there's a sharp change in the image. And it's like something, if you're, you're taking a camera or you're taking a long, um, exposure and something moves suddenly you, you see a sort of blur or you see a, a, a change in the image and so that's what that's what we see here. Why is this impressive? It's impressive because we are not only manipulating individual atoms and measuring the force required to do so it's impressive well I think it's impressive in that what we've basically got is we're pushing on the smallest possible switch you can have. We've miniaturized that all the way down uh, to just two atoms, the smallest possible toggle switch you can, and we can flip that back and forth, measure the force required to do that. And actually by, by changing this, you actually, because what you're doing is chemistry at the single atom, even better, we're doing chemistry at the single bond level, by changing this um, dimer, by changing this particular unit, you can control how electrons flow through it, so you really have got a switch at the atomic level. So, the very first time this experiment worked, the very first time we actually flipped an atom, happened at, oh, 20 to 3 in the morning on uh, the 13th of January, so quite some time ago. So we've been doing this experiment, and Adam in particular has been spending a lot of time in the lab at nights and at mornings. So what you're looking at is the first time it actually worked, um, where this, we saw this change and this change we were expecting. So lots and lots of attempts, nothing happening, nothing happening, going all the way back. Something's happening here, not quite what we wanted, but all the way back, lots and lots of experiments, lots and lots of time trying to do this to work, and then suddenly it worked. And so yes, flipped, and an expletive. <laughs> and um, then it started to work, and it worked really well, and I got somewhat more cocky at this point, um, and then it stopped working. This tip that you use to flick the switch to move yeah. individual atoms, tell me about how big that is. So that tip is a, right at the end, we want it terminated with a single atom, and in fact we spent a lot of our, our experiments trying to get the tip to that point. In fact, the majority of our time is not doing the really exciting, interesting stuff like this. The majority of our time, majority of Adam's time in particular, is getting the tip into a state where you've got one single atom sticking out the end. But what that tip is, is basically a piece of tungsten wire, bog standard tungsten wire, that is etched, electrochemically etched down to a fine point. And then it's attached, it's literally glued on to a tuning fork, a tuning fork actually from a quartz, same type of tuning fork that's in a quartz watch. In every quartz watch and every quartz clock, there's a, there's a tuning fork that basically vibrates back and forth, and that's the timing element. 
So with these experiments, what we do is we glue the tip to a tuning fork. And the way we can work out the force between the tip and the sample is to look at the frequency of that tuning fork, basically, or to look at the frequency of one of the, the legs of that tuning fork and how that changes. And remarkably, just as if you've, you've got a mass on a spring, you change the, 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 the weight on the end of the spring, that will bob back and forth at a different frequency. The force here is not gravity. We're not, gravity on this, <coughs> on these lens scales plays no role at all. The force here is actually due to, that we're interested in is due to the chemical, the, 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 the interaction of individual atoms via a single chemical bond. And we can detect that by the change in the resonant frequency of the, the tuning fork. Uh, we spend uh, very, very many hours. It goes through fits and starts. Sometimes it's, it's almost, never quite nine to five, but sometimes it's almost nine to five. But then other times, like last night, Adam was in here until uh, we actually, Worked, he worked until nine o'clock. We went out for a meal. Adam came back at 11 o'clock and worked through until six in the morning. And sometimes we do, we pull 24, 36 hour shifts. Why are you working these hours? Why do you come in here at night and do this? Some kind of undiagnosed mental condition. <laughs> 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 so we're looking again at those rows of silicon atoms. Um, so here's one row, here's another row. We're basically changing the, the orientation of these dimers um, along this row by using the tip to influence each, each, each dimer. So we are flipping individual atomic switches, basically. You've spent a lot of time in the, in the last year telling me about atoms and how atoms aren't little balls and nothing, nothing in the quantum world is fixed. Everything's moving, everything's blurred, everything's unpredictable. How can you know that you're moving these individual atoms and they're not just moving? That's a uh, fantastic question as usual, Brady. Important thing is that these wave-like characteristics, it depends on how you do the experiment. And this is part and parcel of the, the whole wackiness of quantum mechanics. Sometimes, like here, when we do the experiment, it's a solid object. It's like a sphere. It's, we can see that those are little balls that we are moving back and forth. Um, and it's, it's um, almost digital. We, well, it is digital. It's either like that or it's like that. There are two separate um, orientations of this. But other times when you do the experiments, they don't look like little balls. They act as if they're waves. And a b really good example of this is C60. If we put a C60 molecule on this surface, and we do a lot with, with C60. C60 looks like a football in these images. It's a round object. But people have done diffraction experiments with C60, and where it interferes like a wave. And this is one of the, 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 just the mysteries of quantum mechanics. Why did, sometimes does it look like so much like a particle, like a little ball, and then other times it, looks, it behaves much like a wave? We've waited what seems like a bloody eternity. Um, what is it, an hour? Probably since we've, it takes about a half an hour per scan. Um, so what we have here, here's our first image of the surface where what, we've re what you really want to focus on is this atom. So that atom is the up atom of one of these little switches. So we've got an atom here, we've got an up atom which we can see, but then over here we've got a down atom, we've got the lower atom which we can't see. And then what we've done is we've brought the tip in above this atom and we've pulled it up. And then what happens is it looks like that. So now we can see the up atom and the down atom's done that. So we've got a flip, we've got a toggle. We've toggled this switch between those two states and we're, we, uh, on a single atom, single chemical bond basis. So why did we have to keep that secret? Why did, couldn't we broadcast that or upload that to YouTube six or seven months ago? Well, the, the reason why is for me something that's absolutely fundamental to how science works and it's the process of peer review. So we got the results, we wrote up the paper. We, we were very excited about the results so we decided we'd aim the highest we could which was science and nature. We sent it to science and nature, they said no this isn't interesting enough, um, we're not having it. So we're a bit disappointed about that but then we went down to what many people would consider the sort of next rung down in the ladder for physicists which is physical review letters which is the, the I think many would feel, there may be some debate about this, but many would feel this is the premier physics, physics journal. And then we were delighted to find that the referees, the, the, the editors first of all of physical review letters said yes this is, this is good, we think this is exciting, interesting, we'll send it out to uh, review. Two reviewers came back basically said yeah effectively publish as is. That does not happen very often, certainly not in my career. That's one of the, the, the few times that that's actually happened. I've, I don't know, published off order 100 papers now, maybe three have come back with 
publish as is. Certainly I've never had something go to physical review letters and come back publish as is. So we were delighted, absolutely delighted about that. Um, why is that peer review process so um, important? Why couldn't we just upload the video? Brady and I have had a lot of debate about this, back and forth, exchanging quite lengthy emails. And I am absolutely committed to the idea of peer review. Peer review has its problems. It's the, the standard cliche is, it's like democracy. Um, you know, it's, it's certainly not perfect, but it's the best we've got. The problem is if you don't have peer review in, in place, and people, for example, just rush to the media or rush to set up their, their, their press conference and broadcast the results and publicize the results immediately, where's the quality control? There is no quality control, and you know there have been many cases, and unfortunately, the number of cases where this is happening is increasing quite rapidly, where people have, have, have rushed to the press, and it's later been found out that the results are flawed when it goes to peer review, or indeed some papers go through peer review, and they're also found to be flawed. So that's why you've got that 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 level of peer. That's why you've you, you've got to open up your work and be as open and honest as you can be, and as objective as you can be, and send it out to referees. And yes, in many cases, the, 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 the referees' comments will come back and they'll say, no, we don't like this. But you're a scientist, you've just got to take that on the chin, and you've just got to pick yourself up and then get knocked down again, and pick yourself up and get knocked down again. But you, this, is, this is part and parcel of how science works, and we've got to, have, we've got to be as objective and as critical as, as, as we possibly can. So, with the, the peer review process, there's, there's an interesting friction there between you've got exciting results, you want to get them out, perhaps your competitors are working on this and you really want to, to, to try and, and publicise them as quickly as possible. But for example, if I read an article in a newspaper and it's some groundbreaking new result, particularly in medicine for example, and I read down through that and I come to the last paragraph and, say, and it says something along the lines of, um, the authors of this work or the researchers will uh, submit their paper for peer review soon. I basically reject that. I just place no credence at all in it because until it's gone for peer review, all sort of all bets are off. It could be brilliant, it could be groundbreaking, or it could be completely flawed. I've been looking at some of what you've written and it looks really hard to read and really boring. Who's the <laughs> Yeah, and that's interesting. When you see it, it looks really boring. Uh, we've done our best to write that in as an exciting style as possible. Um, the, uh, it's for other physicists, it's for other scientists. Um, what will happen is um, that we can... Um, we write that in a very scientific, very terse style. Other physicists who are not in the general area of research actually might find some aspects of this quite difficult to get, to get their heads around. Similarly, if I was reading a, a paper on astrophysics, astronomy, particle physics, whatever, in physical review letters. I'd be able to follow the abstract, possibly. I'd be able to follow the intro I'd hope to be able to follow the introductory paragraphs. But in terms of the general detail in the paper, it would just fly completely over my head. In that case, let me ask you this. If only you and a select number of people in the world can understand that paper, how is it doing the world any good? Because it's expanding the, the, the boundaries of science. The important thing is that this, this work has shown that, uh, let's, in our case, it might seem like a, a small step forward, and it is a small step forward, but that's what science is, is all about. It's taking these incremental steps. And although, um, you know, there might be a piece of research, for example, on quantum mechanics that only three people in the world can currently understand, that might just open up the floodgates to actually developing an understanding of all the problems with qu quantum mechanics. You know, what's the nature of the wave function, for example? What's the physical nature of the wave function? And the, the, the problem is trying to predict the impact of a paper or trying to, uh, you know, before the event or trying to ascertain just how much of a reach a paper is going to have is extremely, extremely difficult because science works by little sort of incremental steps that build and build and build and build and build. So st the, the very interesting thing though with nanoscience is that nanotechnology, and this is true for other aspects of, of, of physics as well, is that in some cases a, a fundamental discovery, a paper for example on magnetoresistance, right, which sounds like a very technical term, it is a very technical term, 10 or 15 years later the results in that paper were being translated into iPod technology. And so something that appears very esoteric, very difficult to understand, can in a relatively short period of time 
revolutionise the world. In other cases, it may take 200, 300, 400 years, complex numbers being the case in point.